Okay, next we have uh, Thomas Goss, who's from Wellington, and his topic is orchestration analysis for texture, balance, and function. And he's a freelancer in, in Wellington, uh, specialising in orchestration and arranging and composing, and also in charge of education programs at Orchestra of Wellington. Is that right? Yes. Oh, thank you. Okay, so um, this is a bit of a follow on from. Uh, my last talk with, about it, which was at the, uh, which was at Nelson last year at the Young Composers Workshop, and uh, I talked about the um, fundamental elements of orchestration, texture, balance, and function, but I didn't really apply it to a score. And also, um, I'm more of a practical guy than an academic guy, which, which, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not making a division between the two, but the, you know, the academic really informs what I do, but a lot of times I just have to find out the procedure. So that's basically what this is. It's more of a procedural way of looking at uh, the task of orchestration than a conceptual one in, in a way. So, so, the, um, so I decided that it, it would be kind of cool to describe the process um, of, of doing it. And especially since there's limited time in these lectures, um, especially because I, I would like some Q&A as well afterwards. So if I were to really go into the enormous amount of detail that I put into the uh, into my proposal, which is in the program, now, then it would it would really like we'd be here for an hour. So so I'm going to talk about the velocity of it. Okay. So um, as introduced, I am a working orchestrator, and that involves um, a lot of score reading, a lot of score reading of of like what's out there, what kind of styles that I might want to emulate, be asked to play. In the past 12 months, I've scored about maybe 350 pages of score. That, that would include combined system type layouts um, of about a B4 size sheet of paper. So anyways, so I, I, have, to, I have to process things quickly. I have to decide things quickly. And um, sometimes I don't always make the right choice. But anyways, but this is, this is my particular procedure for tackling it. Okay, so in other words, it's, this is my TED Talk version. Okay, all right, so first to define these aspects really briefly. Um, texture is the vertical aspect. So the simultaneous elements that one is hearing at any given time. One can think of this as a stack of timbres, each played by a separate instrument or group of instruments, or sounds that are inferred by their overtones. Uh, this immediately leads to the next element, balance. How, how are the individual components of texture relating to one another, both vertically, as in our visual perception of a page of score, and spatially, as our two ears perceive the stereophonic effect of a live performance? Though both of these elements can be used to examine the briefest slice of a score, they have a dynamic aspect of flow and change, which leads to their essential partner function. What is happening at any given time in a score, and where does it lead? This is the skeleton underlying the surface of texture and the proportions of balance. It's the meaning of the music. What fascinates me most about this is that orchestral function can be expressed in terms non-specific to harmonic progression or thematic development, as I've done right there, and then reinterpreted in a completely different context that's unrecognizable. Composers have been consciously and unconsciously doing this since the craft of orchestration was developed and especially since Schoenberg's Five Pieces for Orchestra and Pulse's Planets and uh, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring and so on. Um, we as teachers, composers, orchestrators, and sometimes conductors use these principles constantly in our work. As teachers, how many times have we seen a student score that is deficient in meaningful function, or lacks a convincing textural approach, or whose parts are all out of balance? As composers, how often have we thrown away a counter melody or rhythmic element in order to restore clarity to a passage in our own scores? As for conductors, balancing textures is an art, and interconnecting functions a lifelong pursuit. Now, I'm not saying that this is some sort of magic bullet that makes it easier to orchestrate or to understand a page of score, and uh, that's a shame because if it was, then I could package it and market it like this guy. <laughs> Thomas Goss's amazing system of perfect understanding of everything, yeah! <laughs> okay, but all kidding aside, 
thinking along the lines I've mentioned helped me to quickly bring order to my perceptions so that the focus of the attention that is mine to give will go as deep as it can in the limited time that it's given. So here's a page of score uh, chosen at random at four in the morning. Debussy's La Mer, um, it's like page two of Dialogue du Vent et de la Mer. Figure 43 is a beautifully effective bit of orchestration. When I look at it, I perceive the composer's meaning at once. But let's unpack that instantaneous impression with texture, balance, and function. And I think that I subconsciously um, picked something that was easy to explain in, uh, in 10 minutes. Um, and I realize now that I should have picked like a New Zealand composer, so my apologies. Because I've, I've heard some terrific scores, but I just don't have my hands on them. First, the texture. Here's a vertical rendering of what's on that page. The fundamental timbre here is a tremolo on a diminished fifth by the double basses, underlined by a bass drum roll. The low note of F-sharp is doubled by the contrabassoon. The diminished fifth is doubled at the octave by the timpani. Then there's a, the wide open mid-range, filled with the indeterminate tishing of metallophones. Finally, up above, clarinets and muted trumpets are doubled, are doubling, on a concert pitch A minor third, supporting the parallel major thirds in the oboes starting on E. But that's just the fundamental pitch information. The real life in this texture is in its overtones. Anytime the double basses play an interval more closely spaced than an octave, the harmonic resonance above becomes fairly complex. The more dissonant the interval, the more complex the potential resonance. And I know it's hard to say more dissonant or less dissonant. What I mean by more dissonant is that the overtones will fight each other more. This is especially true with Sul Ponticello and Tremolo. Debussy fills in the bass's second partial with timpani, also elevating the conflicting overtones above that. Then he puts cymbals and tam-tam right into the middle of that conflict, complicating certain timbres and smoothing over others. One might infer from this that anything in close proximity would get stomped. But the winds and brass are wonderfully clear because they're placed in registers where they're not only at their fullest, but also resonant with piquant overtones that ring out high above the nebulous middle. And um, you know, I think that if that idea there, the sort of um, the idea in the treble clef were expressed by like tremolo strings or by say flutes and bassoons, um, they really would get stomped out when the uh, when the timpani do their rolls. So this is a sem this is similar to assessing the color scheme of a painting. But now let's look at the landscape of this tonal painting, and I wish I had a, um, like a little laser pointer, but anyways. <clears throat> How do these colors balance, and what are their relationships and proportions? And here I'm fascinated by the independence of the dynamics, how certain tones serve as punctuation, or swell at different times from one another. The contrabassoon pushes the fundamental F sharp, but decays at almost the same rate as with the same tone at the same dynamic level played on piano. So, its placement gives solidity before the entrance of the winds and brass, but returns at the dynamic apex of the phrase of the following phrase rather than two beats before. This helps to maintain Debussy's carefully crafted feeling of unpredictability and to leave more of a gap before it. The basses that the contra is supporting are marked pianissimo throughout the passage, and with the bass drum helping to carry the rumbling tone, that's all that they need to be. The awesome presence of that combination will hang in the air in any reasonably live concert hall, especially if the bass drum is positioned close to the basses on stage. The timpani are another matter. The peaks of their crescendos cannot be allowed to drown out the carefully drawn colors on either side of them. Added to this is the character of an alternating tremolo, quite different from that of two individually rolled timpani, more wild and potentially aggressive. The increased time between alternating notes gives more individuality to each stroke of the beaters and a cumulative effect in a crescendo. The reality in a performance is that the dynamic arc will tend to curve and spike like this rather than forming a perfectly symmetrical angle. Now to the winds, plus trumpets, plus tam-tam. 
the Tam Tam serves, oops. The Tam Tam serves as punctuation to the start of the chord, also as a model for the diminuendo. As its tone decays, so does the wind dynamic. A Tam Tam strike results in a brash flare of tone that is quickly evened out into a hissing ringing by the irregularities of tempering in the metal. But that brief initial attack brings color to the quick bite of tone by the muted trumpets as they in turn double the clarinet sforzando. It's an ingenious idea because it helps the line of the clarinets to emulate the clipped attack of the double reeds above. This naturally leads to function of which this passage has a lot to offer in terms of analysis. As an orchestrator obsessed with tonal coloration, I'd note that the fascination here for me is that the opening harmony is a diminished triad below joined to an augmented triad above, what a jazz player would call a minor 9 flat 5 chord. The clarinets serve as a bridge between these two triads. Debussy uses the context of the previous pedal tone in the timpani to suggest an internal resolution of C minor by the oboes, resting uneasily atop the F-sharp diminished triad at the end of the passage. In a sense, though, the exact harmonic and melodic content, contrapuntal relationships, and rhythmic pulse of this or any passage are immaterial. They're the personality and ingenuity of the composer. A professional orchestrator has to learn to strip scores of such context so that the fundamental elements and the way that they relate may be understood, reimagined, and then adapted to the context of a completely different idea. It's the same way that a composer might develop and personalize a modulation that they heard in a score by Rager, who borrowed it from Schubert, who borrowed it from Carabini. But let's return to the concept of velocity. I just took 750 words to skim the surface of what's in those four bars of La Mer, and I could have said three times as much, but it didn't take me 20 paragraphs of internal dialogue to figure it out. In fact, it didn't matter whether I'd ever heard this passage before or not. I just looked at the page of score and perceived its implications immediately. The texture and balance were obvious at a glance, as were the, function of, uh, the functions of its parts. There's a certain visual facility that develops from huge amounts of scoring and score reading. In fact, it can be so pervasive as to reorder the way we experience events and proce process them. We might think in terms of scoring so much that life becomes a score. A few days ago, while I was writing this speech, I was looking ahead to this weekend and all the steps it was going to take to actually arrive at this place. Getting a ride to the airport, catching a plane, renting a car, driving to my hotel, walking to the university, trying to figure out where things were being held in the building, and so on. And uh, I realized that my apprehensions had bars and staves on them. Um, I was looking it, at it as a score, visually in my head. Um, if I had time to write it out, I'm not sure how interesting it would sound, but it would have meaningful functions and balanced textures, especially those which express potential exasperation. And in my case, it was uh, the exasperation came when I got to the car rental and they told me, you're, Mr. Goss, your, um, your license actually has expired. It's uh, expired four months ago. Um, I was thinking, well, but it's not my birthday yet. Oh, right. Uh, I'm not in America anymore. <laughs> the funny thing is that I do this all the time. Events to come or memories of events past seem like episodes in a big score, especially when I'm sort of like lying there half asleep and I think like, whoa, what happened yesterday? And sort of think, <clears throat> I find myself carefully setting up passages of time so that their functions will be more incisive and their proportions will balance elegantly. Uh, it never happens. I also notice an involuntary tendency to rescore past events, trying to make sense of them with a bit of editing. This is especially tempting when someone else's thematic contribution comes blundering through my conception of what should have happened uh, and just makes a total bollocks of the whole thing. But back to score reading. There's a certain progression of understanding that occurs as the sheer amount of pages that one has, has read start to accumulate. The average music student will, will start with a score in hand, earnestly reading through each line as a recording plays. If they're diligent with their ear training, they'll develop an ever stronger capacity for mental hearing so they can just ditch the recording. After a while, the accumulation of audio memories of superb musicianship will result in an internal orchestra of the best players in their experience who may be asked to perform any passage of music, whether read off a score or imagined while composing. Then there's the final stage, which eventually happens after one has seen many great examples of scoring and understood why they worked, and also seen many attempts at orchestration that don't work in a practical sense. 
you look at a page of music and just get it without having to slow down and hear it mentally or even perceive the notes as events in a sequence. Things just add up like a pattern of mathematical quanta, and strangely, those figures are anything but cold, lifeless data. I'd submit at this point a composer or conductor has their perception of texture, balance, and function honed to a fine point. They may not define it as that, or they may have a specific focus, but there's no way that the score can make sense, at least in a nonlinear way, without considering those elements. Here's an example of what that looks like. A page of score from Lili Boulanger's Vieille et Pierre Boudic that I analyzed for an orchestration lesson once. These are all the things that occurred to me as I was score reading this page. The functions of the lines, their context within the structure of the composition, the texture and balance of the elements, what was the expectation of the composer about the approach of the musicians to perform it. It's difficult to outline the mental process because one gets so used to uh, score reading that one just sees what the composer is up to immediately, but to describe that experience takes many, many words. The impression that I got when I first read this page was simply that it was a great piece of scoring. Epic, committed, and yet finely balanced. Boulanger even gives her heavy brass a few very subtle bars to wake up their embouchures before the big, pu the big push a few bars later. If you look at the whole score, you'll see that she's thought of just about everything. The beauty of it is that this facility can be naturally be reversed. More and more when I'm orchestrating, I see or feel what needs to happen in a page of score, and often the logic of it hangs together so well that there's no need to sketch or take notes. If the idea works, it can only work in the right way, with all its basic elements combining for the maximum amount of impact. Their relationships are usually quite clear, and I can use them to judge both the effectiveness of any given moment of scoring and its linear context within the rest of the work. And that's all I have to say about it. <laughs>